Hello, and happy Monday to you on this December the 11th, 2023. It's a Monday. Hope you're having a great day. This is the 35th lesson in the Everett Hodges archive series of 2023. And it is a lesson from Sunday, December the 8th, 1996. And it is titled, The Open Door of Opportunity. Book of Revelation, written by the Apostle John from the Isle of Patmos, all of which is a vision that appeared to John concerning uh, those things that were to come. In Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, we have a letter written uh, or dictated at least by Jesus to one of seven churches. In Asia Minor, there were a number of cities in which there existed churches of Christ. Seven of them received letters that were dictated by Jesus himself. This one to the church at Philadelphia. And it reads, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews but are not, but lie, behold, I will make them to come and bow down at your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. I'm coming quickly. Hold fast that which you have in order that no one take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, Philadelphia was one of those seven cities in Asia Minor in which there existed a church of the Lord and to whom was addressed this letter from the Lord himself. The letter to the church at Philadelphia contained almost unqualified commendation. Most of the letters to those seven churches contained not only commendation, but also a condemnation. In almost all of them, he said, I know your works, and then he talked about some good things, and then he said, but I have this against you. And then he talked about those things that he had against them and the con uh, condemnation that came as a result of that, but not in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, he had no condemnation for them. To them, he says, I know your deeds, and he commends them for their works and for their faithfulness. He said, you have kept my word and have not denied my name, in verse 8. So because of their well-being in his sight, he has set before them a door of opportunity. He describes the church as having before it an open door that cannot be shut, and Jesus holding the key of David, verse 7, and the one who overcomes will be a pillar in the temple of God, verse 12. Great promise, great commendation of the church in Philadelphia. I believe that we can make some application of that to our day and to the church even today. First of all, he says that there is a door that's open that cannot be shut. There is a door of opportunity that is open. This door that is open and that cannot be shut might be one of two or three things. The idea of doors is very common in the Bible. An open door is a, uh, an opportunity, a door of opportunity. A closed door means that the opportunity is passed. We see it in the, uh, for instance, in the uh, parable of the ten virgins. Remember how that they waited for the bridegroom, and when the bridegroom came and they were gone, and they came back and the door was closed could not be opened. 
opportunity had passed, you see. They had passed up their opportunity. There is the door, which is the opportunity to salvation, first of all. I doubt that that's what Jesus had in mind here, but it is certainly evident in other places in the New Testament. For instance, in Matthew chapter 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about in that uh, text, he called it a gate. But in verses 13 and 14, he said, Enter you by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are they that who enter by it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. And so he talks about there the gate, the door, if you please, of salvation. There are two doors involved in Matthew chapter 7 in that Sermon on the Mount. Both gates are open. One is broad and easy to travel. One of those gates, one of those doors goes to a broad way, a way that's easy. It's a wide gate, easy to enter. The road is wide and easy to travel, not any problem. It's a, a little bit like if we were wanting to go somewhere and we get out here and we get on the big six-lane freeway, you know, and it's, it's just open road. You can just sit out there and go and everything's fine. Problem is with this road that this gate or door enters into, it slopes gently downward and enter, uh, ends up in the de destruction of the hell of fire. It's a road that leads to destruction. Unfortunately, there are multitudes that are traveling that road. There are many that are going through that door that leads to destruction. That's what the world is about. And Jesus said that that's the easy way, and because it's an easy way, a lot of people are going that way. On the other hand, there is the door that is straight or difficult and, in na and, and is narrow, and uh, there's no room on this road for us to take anything along. Difficult, narrow gate, a road that's winding, a road that has its problems along the way, a road that's sometimes difficult to travel. And we might illustrate that by going from this big six-lane highway that we're talking about to a little two-lane dirt road. That's difficult to travel. It has potholes. It has, it has uh, narrow bridges and all of these kinds of things that we have to deal with as we travel. But the difference is that this road leads us where we want to go. It leads to life. It ends up in eternal salvation. As I said, there's no room to take anything along. There's no room for sins. There's no room for selfishness. There's no room for the ragged bundles of the world's morality or any of those kinds of things that are such a common problem to most of us as we travel through life. It's narrow and winding, but it ends up where we want to go. The choice is yours. Which gate do you intend to enter? Which door do you want to go through? Do you want to go through the door of salvation, or do you want to go through the door that leads to eternal destruction? Do you want to travel the six-lane highway that's easy, and you can sit out there and just travel, but it doesn't take you where you want to go? And there are places like that, you know, even, uh, even in thinking about just traveling in a physical sense, there are places that we might want to go that the big six-lane highway won't take us. And if we can get out on that six-lane highway and drive and drive and drive and keep driving, but it won't get us where we want to go. On the other hand, there's the little two-lane road that goes off out into the woods and through the country, the narrow bridges and the winding roads and the potholes and all of that. But if you want to get where you want to go, then you have to travel that road. There's no other way to get there. And so it is in the realm of eternal destruction and eternal life. If you want to go to destruction, then you can get out there on that wide highway and just travel, and that's fine. It'll get you there. But if you want eternal life, then you have to go through the straight gate, the difficult gate, and travel the narrow way. That door is open. That door to eternal life is open. The question is, which door are we going to, to use? Which door of opportunity are we going to take, you see? I think probably what Jesus had in mind here, though, in the context is the door of service. There's a great door of opportunity open to the church in Philadelphia for service. 
for making known the gospel to the world of that time, for making known the gospel in the city of, of Philadelphia, for serving the people not only of the church but also of that community, a great door that's open to them for opportunity. These, there, there were great opportunities for service at that time. Christians at that time were permitted to go about their business speaking a common language. They were allowed to go uh, anywhere they wanted to go just about without any interference. They, uh, there were minds that were in that time and in that area who were groping and hungry for the gospel being taught at that time. So they had some great opportunities. And you see, we can't enter that open door of salvation and sit down comfortably and complacently in the luxurious halls of salvation. We just can't do that. If you want to stay on that straight and narrow road, then you're going to have to go through the door of opportunity for service as well. Because that's a part of our responsibility, you see. Mark Guy Pierce says that unless a man's faith saves him out of selfishness into service, it will certainly never save him out of hell into heaven. Now I'm here to tell you that there are doors of opportunities for service that are open all around us in this 20th century, almost 21st century, in this very city in which we live and where this congregation exists. There are all kinds of opportunities that we have for service. It may be the service of benevolence. It may be the service of kindness. It may be the service of encouragement. There are opportunities to teach the gospel to the lost. Opportunities that we often are passing up. Responsibility that is ours to spread the gospel to a lost and dying world, even in our own community. Now we talk a lot about missions work and we spend a lot of money in missions work to send off to somewhere else across the world, World Bible School, all those things. That's great. That's wonderful. Those are great opportunities. We need to accept them. But there are also opportunities around us as individuals every day to share the gospel that though, with those that we know and those that are lost and those who would listen if we just give them an opportunity to listen. And I know that we get discouraged, and I know that a lot of times we're turned off and people don't want to hear. People are not much interested, and so they don't uh, listen to us very well. But there are opportunities. There are those who are interested. There are those who will listen. The problem is that often we don't use the opportunities when they present themselves. Sometimes we have to make those opportunities. Sometimes we have to make those opportunities by making our presence known among our friends and neighbors and those around about us. Sometimes we have to do some other things to get our foot in that door, to get that door open. It may be picking up the neighbor's mail while he's gone. It may be feeding his dogs while he's gone. It may be uh, taking a dish over there when the wife is sick or whatever it is. There are all kinds of things, opportunities of service that present themselves that open up a door for opportunity to teach the gospel. And it's those kinds of opportunities that we need to be aware of and that we need to make use of while they're there. Before the door is closed. Now, there were obstacles to these people in Philadelphia to their entering that open door. Jesus said in his letter to them, I know that you're going, there are problems. You're going to have to face some difficulties. First of all, he said, you're weak. You have a little power. Maybe they were small. I don't know what size they were. Uh, maybe they were composed of lower class of Roman society. Maybe they didn't have much money. Maybe they didn't have much education. Maybe there were some other reasons. They had no great natural influence in the city, perhaps. But this was not to deter them from using that door of service. 
And there are obstacles. There are difficulties that we face. And obviously different ones of us have different doors that are open. Some of us are more able to deal with those doors than others. We have different abilities. We have different levels of, of knowledge. We have different levels of ability in using that knowledge. There are a lot of factors that are involved. And all of those are to be taken into consideration. But the fact is that every single one of us can go through that door of opportunity if we choose to do so. There was opposition to their work, probably from the Jews in verse 9. He says, I'll cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they're Jews, but they're not. Probably there were those that were opposing anything that they would try to do because of their feelings. There's always a temptation when there is any kind of opposition to the truth to just sit back and remain quiet. Just to say, well, you know, everybody's opposed to this. And I'm going to stir up a hornet's nest, and so I'm just going to be quiet. I wonder where the church would be if early Christians had taken that road that so many of us take today. They were persecuted. They were beaten. They were thrown in jail. There were all kinds of oppositions that came to the, to the Christians of, of the first century. And yet the church grew phenomenally. Why? Because they went everywhere preaching the word in spite of the opposition. They used the opportunities that they had of service and of preaching the gospel. He makes clear to Philadelphia that you can be effective. He said, I'll make them come and bow down at your feet. Jesus said, Hello, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. He didn't say we'd always be successful. He didn't say that everybody would listen to us that we wanted to talk to. But he said, I'll make you effective. I'll be with you. It's the gospel that changes lives, folks, not us. It's the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation. It's the message, not the messenger. All we need to do is teach the gospel, and God will give the increase. We get everything all backwards, you know. We, we think that it's, we don't have the ability to do it, you know, in a fluent a uh, very effective, powerful manner that, we're, that we can't do it. The message. God chose by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The message is what's important. Oh, there were obstacles. But those obstacles were not to deter them from their work. There was the threat of tribulation. Persecution was dead ahead. They'd already seen a lot of it. It was yet to come. This was in probably 95 AD. Persecution had been great before them. Persecution was yet to come, and it did. Rome became very severe in their persecutions later on, as they had been in the past. At this particular time, persecution is at rest a little bit, but it will come again. And as we said earlier, all through that first century, church underwent severe persecution. Christians underwent very severe persecution. There were times when they had to meet in the catacombs because they, they were not allowed to meet anywhere else. And if they got caught even meeting there, they'd be put to death. And here we sit in this 20th century, able to meet anytime we want to, anywhere we want to, just, just about, to worship, to serve, to teach, without any kind of interference from the government or anybody else. We don't have to worry about somebody whipping us because we're going to preach the gospel as a general rule. We don't have to be worried. We don't have to worry about being cast into jail because we're out here preaching the gospel somewhere. Because we decide that somebody doesn't really want to listen, then we don't really try. Doors are open. There may be obstacles, but it isn't enough to keep the word 
and not deny Christ. There must be active effort to spread the gospel and thereby the kingdom. We are not to be keepers of the door, but to go through the door to active service. And maybe we need to understand that any kind of service that we do, whether it be, as I said earlier, getting the neighbor's mail or feeding his dog or, or helping someone who is uh, down, encouraging someone who is down, whatever it is, those kinds of things open doors for teaching the gospel. It's those kinds of things that bring recognition to Christians and their Christian attitude about service. And as that attitude is portrayed, then we have opportunities to teach. At the very least, we have opportunities to invite them to services of the church where they can hear the gospel preached by someone else. Where they can sit in a Bible class and perhaps learn something that will help them to understand the gospel of Jesus. A good example is this young Kim French, who is a new member here, was here this morning. Was baptized a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago now. One of the members of the church at White Rock, not the preacher, not one of the elders, but one of the members of the, of the church in White Rock, came in contact with her in a kind of program that he was involved in and that she was involved in also. They became friends, and he began to teach her, and he taught her the gospel of Jesus. She was baptized into Christ. She's excited, full of excitement about that, and is here in worship and wanting and willing to grow, to study and to learn because of the excitement that the gospel has brought to her life. Somebody used that door of opportunity, you see. Somebody who had a contact other than just going and saying, I want to teach you the gospel, but using that contact for an opportunity, for a door of opportunity of service to teach her about salvation. We have those same kinds of opportunities every day. And I'm as guilty of allowing those doors to close as anybody I know. But we need to repent and do better. In verse 7, he tells us that Christ holds the key to the door. Christ certainly has the key to the door of salvation. That key is the cross. It's by the cross that the door is opened and no man can shut it. Man can't open it, man can't close it. God opened it through the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That opened the door. And no man will ever close that door. It's open to every man under heaven. Every man, every woman under heaven. That door is open to him. And Christ holds the key through the cross. The question that we must answer is, have we entered that door? We can attend church regularly. regularly. We can take communion. We can listen to teaching. We can be firmly convinced of the way of salvation and still refuse to enter that door. It's obedience to that gospel that gets us through the door. The door is the cross. It's our obedience to that gospel of the cross that gets us through the door. And until we've obeyed that gospel, until we have believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we believe in His death, burial, and resurrection. We repent of our sins. We confess our faith before men, and then we're baptized for the remission of sins. Until that happens, we haven't entered the door. Door's there. The key is the cross. But until we've done that, then we've not entered the door. So the question is, have we entered the door? Have we gone through that door of salvation? You see, those who do all those things that we were talking about a minute ago and refuse to enter the door will one day hear, I never knew you. 
doesn't make any difference how good we've been or how many good things we've done. But we're like that man with the one talent. You know? Or we're like those of whom Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount when he said that there are many who in that day will say, Lord, did we not in thy name do many wonderful works and in thy name cast out demons and so on? And I'll say to you, depart from me, workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Because he says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of the Father who is in heaven. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. And one day, that door will be shut and cannot be opened. The door is now open and cannot be shut. But the time will, close, will come when it will be closed and cannot be opened. In Luke 13, verses 24 to 28, Jesus said, Strive to enter by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you're from. Then you will begin to say, we are, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught us in the streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you're from. Depart from me, all you evil doers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth there when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being cast out. The door is going to be closed. If we don't take advantage of the opportunity while it's open, one day it will be closed. One day the Lord will come and close the door, never again for it to be opened. But he has the key to the door of service as well. He provides many opportunities. We've already talked about that a great deal. He'll provide more if we're patient and prepared. Many doors are already standing open. Others will be open. We've seen doors open up in recent times in, when in the fall of the uh, communist regime in Russia. A lot of doors have opened in that. A lot of doors are opened up through World Bible School. There are doors that are open right here in this community. And so long as there is immorality and evil doing and all of those kinds of things, there will be the doors open to the gospel and those things will always be. And we must take advantage of the opportunities as they come and while they remain. This is the message to the church in Philadelphia. His words or not to a few certain individuals, nor to the ministers, nor to the elders, but to the whole church of Philadelphia to whom he's opened the door. The message also is to us. This is the New Testament ideal. How much impact is the church making on the community? Are we going through the doors as they open? To his exhortation, Christ adds promises. He said, I'm coming soon, verses 11 and 12. Go through the door of salvation and on through the door of service and evangelism, and you'll be made pillar, stable, unmovable, secure, which will not fall. And in verse 13, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen to me. It's a little bit like my daddy used to say, and I remember it. Wasn't good grammar, but he'd say when he wanted me to understand something, he'd say, you listen here to me. And that's what Jesus is saying. You listen here to me. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what's going to happen commended the church of Philadelphia because the door was open because of their faithfulness because of the way that they had conducted themselves as a as a church of the Lord the door was open and would not be shut and now it's up to them and it's up to us the door stands open and invites us 
We must go through that door before it's closed for good. If you haven't gone through the door of salvation, you need to do that this very night. Because tomorrow that door might be closed. If you've not gone through the door of, of, of service and evangelism, you need to go on through that and get started. So that we can see the church grow through the spread of the gospel of Jesus. If you need his invitation, come as we stand here.